Uh, so picking up on the conversation that we just heard surrounding issues of affordability, uh, we're going to expand the discussion today to uh, address network resilience, reliability, and competition. Uh, I think as we were all reminded this summer with the Rogers outage that affected people across the country, people in the millions uh, from coast to coast, as well as weather events on the East Coast that knocked out service in a time of emergency for uh, people's home internet, their telephone, and uh, mobile services at a, a point in time when communication was vital. Uh, this topic of network reliability and resilience uh, is at the front of mind. The impact is felt across the country and not just for people who want to watch uh, video online or use social media, but for emergency services, for banking and commerce more generally, highlighting how much we all rely upon these services to conduct our daily affairs. Uh, in the wake of that outage, the federal government requested that communications providers work together to ensure that mutual assistance would be given in the case of such an emergency going forward. I believe a memorandum of understanding was uh, signed in the beginning of September uh, and the exact uh, sort of progress uh, is being worked out to date. The CRTC has pledged to investigate, although much of the information that has been submitted to them is secret. It's been filed in confidence by Rogers, and I hope that perhaps some of the experts on today's panel will help us get to the bottom of the causes of this type of outage. As well, the Parliamentary Industry Committee uh, has studied the issue and uh, presumably will be releasing a report at some point in the future. So while the sausage makes its way through the grinder and before memory fades, I'd like to ask what lessons we can learn from all this so that we can improve the situation going forward. Is the response that I've just discussed enough or do we need to push further to make sure that vital communication services remain available to people when they need them, where they need them, and whenever they need them? Will the government's efforts bear fruit? And is there an expanded role for competition and technology as well as policy uh, in containing such harm in the future? Uh, with that, I'll introduce our panelists, and I guess we'll go my left to right. So first we have Gamble, uh, <laughs> who has worked in the service provider industry for over 20 years, has extensive experience directing a broad range of telecommunication, internet services, and regulatory initiatives. Next to Matt is Hossein Bedran, who is a senior director with ISOC Global. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Queen's University and spent over a decade at Cisco, which is one of the world's leading pro uh, producers of network equipment. Uh, next to Hose uh, Hossein, who likely needs little introduction for most people, Michael uh, is a public commenter on all issues communication in Canada. Uh, he hosts a weekly podcast called Law Bites, and his writing is available on his website. Uh, on issues covering copyright, uh, surveillance, privacy, telecommunication, and broadcasting, most recently, of course. Finally, we have Francis. <coughs> Finally, we have Francis Carreau, who is the chief network op uh, officer and co-founder of Oxio, a wholesale-based service provider, who listeners of Canada Land will know, uh, working towards bringing more affordable internet to a broader section of the population. So thanks, and uh, Matt will uh, kick it off with a few opening statements. Uh, sure, so I guess we can talk first, we want to talk about the Rogers edit first, and exactly what happened from a technical perspective. Um, I'll just dive right into it. Uh, the Rogers outage was basically caused by what's known as a BGP failure. For those who are not network people, um, BGP is the protocol that makes the internet work the way it does today. It's how routers learn how to get to each other, so think of it as like a big tree. So my router doesn't talk to your router, your router doesn't talk to your router, et cetera. And so packets need to get from A to B, is the sort of tree to get there. And as you can imagine, when the internet being global and the size it is, this tree is really, really big now, right? This is a massive tree of how to get from A to B. So if, at the edge of your network, you normally have big border routers that sort of handle this tree and figure out how to get everywhere. But on the inside of your network, you don't send the whole tree down. You just say, hey, I just need to get from, you know, Toronto to Ottawa, I don't need to figure out how to get anywhere else, so I'll just know the path to get to Ottawa. So you give your inside routers a lot less information. The mistake Rogers made when they did this big network update was they sent the full tree to the entire network. So 
this small node router in the middle of nowhere that didn't really have a lot of memory and a lot of capacity, all of a sudden now has to take on this massive dictionary of how to reach the entire world. What happens when it gets this much information? It goes, ah, and just crashes. <laughs> and so when that happens, that router goes down, next router goes down, and cascade failures all the way down. Now all your routers are offline, and now your, your packets can't get anywhere, and your network fails. So in a nutshell, that's sort of the technical side of how the Rogers network out of chat. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Hossein, do you uh, want to pick it up? Yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, beyond the, the, the how the, the failure actually happened, I think a key lesson learned from there is that it became very clear that um, businesses, enterprises, points of sale rely on a single infrastructure to connect to the internet. The diversity of access, what we call also dual homing, is not non-existent. And the mobile um, mobile provider, uh, such as Fido, for example, relies on the Roger network for that transport. So connecting your mobile to find one connected to the home internet or the enterprise internet to, uh, to Rogers is again a single point of failure. Once Rogers is down, also your mobile connection is down. And this scenario has to be avoided. And um, I think it has to do with what we heard before in the previous panel on competition, making comp competitors available at all network layers um, and allowing the framework for these competitors actually to survive and be profitable and not being bought out by the larger, larger players. Um, uh, this um, investment in infrastructure is key and uh, has to be seen with a very high priority from the authorities to modify the current approach in the regulatory framework. I think this is a wake-up call for, for the internet resiliency in Canada, which I'm sure we'll be talking about more during the panel. Okay. Um, so I'm not a technical person in the, the scale, someone like Matt, so I'll talk about the policy side. And it reiterate a little bit the comments that I made before the industry committee when they conducted their sort of emergency hearing um, on this. And it seems to me there are at least five failures that we ought to be focusing on. Uh, one is a competition failure. The reality is we, we find as, as the marketplace becomes increasingly consolidated, the, the impact of having one of those very large providers fail in the way that we saw over the summer becomes even more pronounced. And so the benefits that come from more competition, more choice, have implications not just for the costs that consumers face, but also for the resiliency of the network. And I think we've had a failure there. I think we have a, a cost failure that kind of flows from that. You know, it's one thing, and we still haven't had a good investigation into it, how you have a service like Interact find itself go down. I find it inexplicable that um, large payment providers would find themselves in this position. But I think it's far more understandable why everyday consumers, such as myself, would find themselves in a large uh, bucket of just Rogers services. Um, and it could have been Bell, it could be anyone, but in this case it was Rogers and it meant uh, that all connectivity amongst all members of my family was lost and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room that faced the same sort of thing. And it seems to me that in an environment where many Canadians, I think rightly based on the data, feel that they pay too much for communication services, particularly when compared to other jurisdictions, they take matters into their own hands. They're now regularly told, well, you need to negotiate, you need to sort of fight back. But uh, the reality is some people will do that. Many people will just look for a bundled offering that may reduce um, some of their costs or make it at least feel that it's a bit more economical and there kind of there's a risk associated with that and anybody who decided to take the Rogers bundle and family plan and all kinds of things associated with that learn some of those costs back in uh, back over the summertime. I think we have a failure of consumer protection in this country the fact that Rogers started by saying I, I think they started by saying we'll provide a day of compensation and people thought that wasn't good enough and they said okay fine we'll provide five days worth of compensation uh, we need clear-cut consumer protection rules about these sorts of things we need clear-cut transparency about when uh, significant outages occur so the consumers will know when they're when they are ought to be or when or at least when they ought to be compensated um, for the uh, lack of availability of a service and yet we don't have those things in Canada. Uh, I think we have a lack of transparency associated with this. Ben highlighted how much of the information that's been provided was redacted information back to the CRTC. In real time, we had a failure of transparency in terms of knowing what was taking place. 
And finally, I think we've had a failure from a government oversight perspective. Uh, it is the government that has allowed these issues to fester. It is the government that, even in the aftermath of this, frankly, has done very little. I had to go take a look to see whether or not the industry committee has actually done anything since that initial rush to be seen to be doing something. Um, and frankly, even the Minister Champagne seemed to be more concerned that he wasn't immediately called uh, when this took place, as opposed to actually dealing with some of these issues. I don't know why it's relevant whether or not the industry minister is the first person you call when you have a network outage. I must admit, I don't know why that would be the first person that you would expect to be called. Uh, unless you've got a government that wants to be seen to be doing something as opposed to be doing something. And that, that is, I think, perhaps the most fundamental failure. Um, where we've got a government on these issues, and this is not a partisan issue because this cuts across both liberal and, and conservative governments over the years where there's a lot of talk about doing something, but thank you, it's frankly, far less action. Um, coming from a technical background, uh, I won't add anything uh, that what Matt said. I think it was uh, extremely well digested information, but maybe the perspective I can provide is uh, from a TPIA provider that's actually using Rogers Network. And uh, the perspective I want to provide is communication. I woke up on that Friday morning with an alarm on my phone because we didn't have any traffic passing on the link. Uh, we didn't have any communication from Rogers until maybe two or three in the afternoon. And then we figured out that it was an outage because we just looked at the BGP routes dying and dying, that's public information on the internet, and we thought, okay, well, this is going bad. Then once service was gradually restored, uh, we had some customers having saturation issues, and then we didn't really know where things are going. And I think, <clears throat> I th of course, there are more priority customers than Oxio as a TPIA. There's 911 dispatch centers, there's the Interact network. Uh, but I think in the list of priority, I don't think TPIA providers should be at the bottom. Uh, one customer actually represents 40,000 homes. And I think we should be a bit higher in the list when it comes to communication, so we can rely the information to our customer. Actually, we, were, we inform our customers that Rogers had an outage even before we got an official communication from them, which I think really highlights the big communication problem that we're seeing. Uh, outages are a thing in network engineering. Uh, uh, we have access, Oxio, to a tiny bit more of Roger's behind the scene network, and yes, I can confirm that from the tiny bit more we're seeing, let's say from a retail customer, that their network is problematic, but outside of this, I think a really strong communication plan uh, that's tested is the key forward because these things will happen at different scales. It could be a local outage, but if it's a local outage for only a neighborhood, it's still a few small businesses that cannot process payments, that cannot operate. So whatever the scale of the outage, which is national or small, I think incumbents should have way better communication plans. Okay, thanks for your comments, everyone. And I think uh, that there's a common theme emerging here. You know, this is a, a very harmful type of problem. Everyone relies on communication service. Uh, in the event that it goes down, uh, we were really caught unaware. So, so saying you mentioned that this is a wake-up call. And so take, picking up on that idea of a wake-up call, I'd like to ask maybe, since this is such a, a big system we're talking about, there's lots of technical details. It touches so many people. There's technical detail, there's regulatory detail, there's economic issues. Why don't we start uh, by identifying a bit of low-hanging fruit? Uh, you know, we're going to be dealing with these types of issues. Where are the first things we should be reaching for uh, in terms of tools that can actually uh, sort of staunch the bleeding, that can reduce the harm, and that can actually have an impact? Not phone calls to the minister, not memorandums of understanding, but concrete steps that we can take to address these types of problems to dis to minimize the disruption. So, I, so, so, do you, so. I'll, I'll take it. Um, so first, I think we need to understand a little bit when we talk about TPIA, third party internet access, how it works today. People think wholesale access just means that you buy the Rogers cable when it comes directly to you guys, but it doesn't actually work that way, right? When you buy TPIA today, it actually gets routed through Rogers back to you, which is why you're sort of dependent on the Rogers network. 
Um, one of the things that came out of the disaggregated framework, which was brought up in the last panel, was the idea of doing actual interconnection fiber-based at the head ends or at the Belcio, which the Belcio is far too small, but we'll, that's a whole separate issue. But in the event that these third-party providers were actually able to interconnect with Rogers in more places and remove more dependency on the Rogers network, it would actually let them be more resilient. If you were able to pick up stuff at a head end, for example, you'd be able to get around an issue that was taking out Rogers' nationwide backbone, right? It would be more localized outages rather than a nationwide outage if we were able to get in there at a, at a lower level. And I think from a regulatory perspective, if we get rid of this aggregated framework that says everything must go through the, the incumbent to get to the wholesale provider, and we say, no, no, we're gonna break this up and disaggregate it more so that there's more points of interconnection, that'll instantly increase resiliency in the networks and provide an easy bang for our buck. Now, there's a whole bunch of other regulatory challenges that putting costing and other things that have stopped it from becoming a reality, but it's a fundamental thing that we should do, and it's probably the step we need to move towards. Um, thank you, yes, <clears throat> um, I uh, agree, and in addition to this, uh, I think it's important for, uh, if you look, take for example enterprise, uh, enterprise uh, or enterprises that want to connect to the internet, it's critical not only to be connected to a um, reliable, reliable provider, or even two of them, but to understand how this provider is connected and how where he gets his transit traffic. Um, so that you can, the, can the enterprise can make a decision. I guess I'll uh, dual home and take the cost of having dual connections, but they don't go over the same transit provider. This is a very important point to avoid a single point of failure. If we, if we know that you're getting your traffic on ISP, have two ISPs and they get their transit from the same incumbent or the same large operator, this is really not to the homing. You're still reliant on a single link to the internet, a single transit capacity to the internet. So this kind of decision, this kind of awareness is an important aspect where enterprises have this choice to make an informed decision by asking questions and making informed decisions how do they connect to the internet and having actual dual homing over two transit providers as, as a choice. Um, second, um, and ha having a failover, automatic failover, a failover configured, so once a provider um, is out of service, automatically the network is reconnected to a second one without significant or without no, ever, no outage uh, altogether. If we take the, the case of a um, um, home worker, a person who works from, from home, um, it's important that this approach of a family package um, has, has its benefit from a price point of view, from cost point of view, but has consequences from resiliency. And this, is not, this needs to be taken into consideration. If you're working from home, you need to have a reliable backup connectivity to the internet. So the minimum one, one should do is to have the mobile service from a different provider, from a different network provider, than your, your um, home internet access. Um, avoiding completely having two services on the same network. So one, could be for the, one could be for Bell, and the other could be from Fido, who works or runs over the larger network not from the same provider. These are decisions that, that a, home, a, work, a home owner or working from home can make based on, on such awareness and such information. Potentially, the, the employer could compensate the, the home worker for his connectivity to the internet, potentially. But at least he would be, the, home, the, the home worker will be guaranteed that if one provider goes down, he still have backup connectivity uh, over the second link to the internet and he continues to do his, uh, his work. So, um, having more than one provider or, or taking, uh, taking your mobile service from a Bell and your home internet service from a Rogers uh, sounds like uh, a good way of ensuring that your service will remain if one of them goes down. Uh, but I'm thinking about my parents, you know, who want to have everything on one bill because they've got a lot of things going on. Uh, we heard from the last panel that maybe not everyone has the time to do something like that. Uh, or the technical wherewithal. So what, what do we say to someone who, who, who might not have the type of knowledge that we have about redundancy and who might not be able to foresee? Is there some sort of uh, you know, framework that we think of or, or uh, I think I'm thinking of consumer protection, like best practices perhaps from other industries that can be imported here to help consumers who, who might not be prepared in advance for something like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. So, I, I mean, I don't think there's any easy solution that's cost-free from a consumer perspective to address some of those issues. There are costs. I think some consumers may 
uh, come out of what took place over the summer and decide that they don't want to see that happen again. They're not going to trust in the government or the CRTC or their own individual provider, but there's a price to pay to be paid associated with that. And um, some may do it for a time, and then as they see the bills increasing, they may decide that they, they want to move away. I do think that, at a minimum, in the moment that these things occur, there are things that can be done. Now, I think I mentioned consumer protection issues um, in my opening, and, and I would maintain that one of the outcomes that comes out of this should be clear-cut rules about compensation uh, with respect to network outages, which I think helpfully creates incentives for providers to limit those outages uh, because there is actually a price to be paid um, as, a, as, as a default, not something that you have to spend 45 minutes on hold waiting to complain that your, your network was out for a period of time, I'd like to be compensated, um, and then have to, and they say no, and so you say send me to retention, and eventually somebody gives you something. Uh, you shouldn't have to argue for this. It should be simply a matter of course. You paid for a service, it wasn't provided, you're provided with compensation. Now the question becomes, how do you even know about this? And we do need far more real-time transparency associated with things like network outages. And you know, I suspect many people here live in Ottawa. Um, and so we go through power outages. It seems we've gone through a bunch over time, um, whether it's through tornado or other kinds of things that have taken place. And uh, Hydro provides real-time mapping to tell you when, where, where the outages are, uh, they provide through Twitter and other social media, letting you know uh, how long they think this is going to take, how many homes are affected. Um, people are kept informed. And I have to say that beats the, the ritual that quite literally takes place in my neighborhood regularly. Several of my best friends all happen to live in the neighborhood. And invariably, every few months, there is this text exchange, is Rogers down? Um, and is it down for you? Is it, is it because there's a problem with your own router? Is it down in the neighborhood? Is it down more broadly? And there is no easy way to, to find out any of this kind of information. This clearly should be part of the basic kind of service that we can expect. We see it with other services that have a utility-like function or that frankly are utilities. I think these communication services qualify in much the same way. And so while it doesn't solve some of the issues that you just highlighted, Ben, I think it would at least go a long way to providing people with a sense, is it me or, or is it Rogers? And most of the time it's probably Rogers, but not always. And we need to have a sense, I think, of when that is and then how long is this going to be a problem because then people can take appropriate measures to deal with it. If you're working from home uh, and your plan is to work from home and Rogers advises that, you know what, this is, this is a 12 hour outage. Don't, don't expect to be able to work from home today if what you're looking for is connectivity. People can make arrangements or try to make arrangements to deal with it if they can. If they don't have that information, um, they're kind of stuck. I fully agree uh, with Dr. Geist. I'm on Reddit and I'm following the Rogers subreddit and I need to say that half of the post is, is Roger down in my neighborhood. I do not understand why they don't have a system like Hydro Quebec or Hydro, uh, Hydro One or Hydro Ottawa to inform. Um, it is true that the disaggregated model uh, would add redundancy in the network. It comes with other challenges. I want to offer the perspective that it's possible to offer uh, redundancy on the aggregated model. Uh, when Rogers was down, I was discussing with Bryson at the CNOC. We were just chatting uh, by text message, and uh, he brought the idea to me. He's like, under the 2019 288 decision, could you, Oxio, offer a fully redundant product? And if so, for how much more than the regular internet? So, of course, that's a challenge. I'm going to accept it and build just a mock business case. And uh, I was surprised by the answer. $25 to $35 more to a regular internet service. I think um, redundancy options are offered to big accounts, to um, the, the big corporations, the public safety. Of course, uh, it's important. But I think the rest of us also can benefit from a fully redundant network. Small businesses to process payments and to offer services to their uh, customers. Same thing for remote worker. And at a price point that's $25 to $35 more than your regular internet, including the hardware that would steer between either the Bell DSL network, hopefully fiber someday, and the cable network, it becomes 100% transparent for anyone any remote worker that wants to be online all the time, it's a very small price point. And I think that 
uh, we're talking a lot about redundancy and that's super important, but I think affordability for service-based provider like us can make us innovate product that the incumbents can't because they won't use their competitor's network. We're neutral. We don't care about the network. We just want to offer the best service. So by adding such a product, by allow if the CRTC would give us more flexibility on the pricing and let's say it would go forward with the two at the 2019 288 we could offer a product like this that would bring redundancy uh, for the rest of us so we've got the idea that um, the regulatory environment can enable better competition if it's worked right I mean we're hearing lots of acronyms TPIAs disaggregated 2019 88s and uh, you know some of us might know what all this means, but uh, to the listener, there might be a lot of uh, sort of technical jargon to unpack here. Um, it seems to me that across the technical solutions, the economic ones, and the consumer-facing ones, um, we have this common problem of do we trust the systems that we've set up to bring these things about? Uh, the disaggregated and wholesale-based solutions can allow service-based providers to uh, fill gaps and to innovate in ways that the incumbent providers have not if the regulatory system works the way it's supposed to. I think uh, listening to previous panels, it seems to be the sentiment is it's not working just how, it's, how it should. You know, the hydro outage maps when power goes out is a reliable system that's in place, but how do we get there in telecom? You know, the systems that we have that are supposed to produce these things haven't done it yet. You know, we've heard about a somnambulant CRTC that just isn't doing anything in recent years. We hear about the minister making his phone calls, but no one knows exactly what's come out of it. Um, how, how is it we can bring about actual change in this space going forward? Do we need to think uh, beyond just the specific technical implementation or the economic implementation towards bigger pictures of what Jeff White earlier today called the political economy questions here. I'm sorry, I know that's a lot to ask, but I mean, I think in my own research, looking at this, uh, trying to think of problems for competition in telecom, I inevitably end up at this issue with big systems not doing what they're supposed to. So uh, perhaps uh, I could invite some wide-ranging comments on that. I can start if you like. Um, just by noting that in the aftermath of that hearing in the summer, I put together a sort of kind of cutesy quiz um, <laughs> where, where I invited people to guess who said it. What did it. Was it said by the chair of the CRTC, Ian Scott, or was it said by the CEO of Rogers, Tony Staffieri? And um, my recollection it took a long time for someone to be able to guess all 10 correctly. Um, so we'll know that we have, at, are at least on track to address these issues when the head of the regulatory agency and the CEO of Rogers don't sound identical um, when it comes to science. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that is fundamentally that big, that is the big picture problem. And, you know, whether it's this specific chair or when we get a new chair, whether things will change. I don't know, I, I, well, I, I don't believe that we, at least over the last number of years, um, have seen the CRTC adopt a position that that puts, I think, the con these kinds of priorities at the center of its regulatory environment. Um, and this isn't about meeting in bars with senior executives. It's fundamentally about positioning yourself as seeing the role of the CRTC as being one acting in the public interest, not acting on behalf of any specific interest, particularly some of um, large incumbents, and and being willing to take on if necessary, a more confrontational position. And it's not confrontation for confrontation's sake. It's not about uh, sort of trying to make enemies with large telecom companies or large internet companies or uh, whoever, whoever happens to be large in this space. It's recognizing that there is already a regulatory power imbalance that exists. It's great to see the Internet Society Canada chapter more actively engaged on the, this issue and many other issues. It's been a really I think important voice on a lot of pieces of legislation. So it's great to see these things happen. There are some other groups that take place, but we need to recognize when the government likes to talk about leveling the playing field, perhaps it should start with leveling the playing field that takes place in the regulatory environment 
around communications, both broadcast and telecom. Uh, because that is not at all a level playing field. I think most people recognize that. And it leads to really bad outcomes, particularly uh, where you have people in positions of power who don't either recognize it or see it as part of their mandate uh, to address some of those kinds of, some of the imbalances that exist. If I could add to uh, what Dr. Geis uh, said, uh, I had the chance to uh, see the network operations center of one or two incumbents in my life, and they do have the data. They do have those giant screens with maps, and when a sector goes down, it flashes red, and they know exactly every address that's down. I think it's a bad intention on their end, or it benefits them to not put the information on their website. The data's there. They don't even need to work to create a system. It's just to take that system and put it on a status page. And virtually every SaaS provider, and also most of telecommunication companies in the United States and Europe, have a status page. It is not out of the ordinary to have that. Yet, our biggest telecom companies do not have that, even though they have the technology. I, can, I, I hope it's not this, but I... The only thing I can come to the conclusion is that it's in their interest to hide the information. Well, it's in their information right now because they're, 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 they're in this interesting place where they're walking this line between we're not a utility, but we are a utility, right? And as they, they want to keep saying we're not a utility, we're not a utility. You don't have to regulate us like a utility. But at the end of the day, all Canadians see them as a utility. All Canadians view them as a utility. You, you consider the internet almost as essential as your power at this point. Um, and in Roger's own filings, when they were in one of the MDU filings, they refer to themselves as a utility, yet we don't regulate them as one. So maybe it's time we take that underlying infrastructure and say, we'll regulate you like a utility, and then we can start pushing for things like the status maps and things you want, instead of letting the market forces decide what needs to be there. Maybe to add to the excellent points already made, um, I think there is a, a sense in the community that the, the resilience um, internet resilience in Canada is really at, at the crossroads. And um, a survey was done by um, an entity that's affiliated with ISAT uh, called the um, Canadian uh, Digital Internet um, uh, Resiliency Forum, or the Forum for Digital uh, Internet Resiliency. Um, the Internet Resiliency Working Group there is that's composed of um, um, civil society as well as technical um, um, CERA and um, TORIX and other uh, telecom, telecom players. Um, did a survey for the for, for the inter, for the inter community in Canada, the IXPs, the CNOC, um, the competitive wireless uh, operators, uh, and others, about what they see as priority for internet resiliency in Canada. What would be the impact of various outages on disrupting the internet? What the assessment of the current state of internet resiliency in Canada, and identifying top internet resiliency concerns that they see as working in this, in this, this domain. And the, the, the results were quite um, potentially as, as we expected, but they're quite really telling of the, of the, of the status quo. One of the, the key concerns, that, the, highest, the highest important key concern that was identified is that um, there exists uh, um, the existence of single points of failure in the Canadian internet infrastructure, particularly from an east-west kind of fiber map point of view. Um, this kind of, um, of single point of failure will have a dramatic effect if it happens on the internet connectivity across, across the country, country or in particular regions. The concentration of, of connectivity in particular points like data center and IXPs is of, of concern. And here then the multi-homing or dual homing becomes a critical issue that needs to be addressed. The, the second point is the risk of the 24-7 availability of critical services, of uh, internet services. Uh, like like the um, 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 uh, DSN, like uh, the timing timing services, and these if these are impacted, the internet service itself will be will be out out, uh, out, out of, of service. Lack of visibility of network outages. We, uh, Dr. Geis has mentioned this. Lack of visibility of exactly what, what's going on and how the consumers will be impacted and how this the, these outages will be repaired on a specific time frame. This kind of visibility does not exist. Transparency of the availability of fiber maps. This also is not, not non-existent. Um, where does fiber uh, go? To which, to which operator? And the possibility of increasing these number of fibers also does not exist. It's a big secret, either from private sector or from, from the public sector, because government itself invests heavily in promoting fiber connectivity, particularly um, in the Canadian North. When the government does this kind of projects, which are huge projects, 
this information is kept behind closed doors. While it is for the public benefit to know where these fibers are being laid and ensure that the maximum number of communities are connected to these fibers to get the benefit um, out of it. So, um, uh, and then finally, lack of adoption of, up, of the most uh, up to date technology standards like IPv6, like DNSSEC, DNS security, and, and similar, and similar um, international, uh, important uh, telecommunication standards or networking standards. Lack of adoption of these by the large, large operators. So these are concerns really that have been raised by, by the internet community in Canada and they need to be, need to be addressed, addressed in specific recommendations, but not only recommendations, because yes, there are efforts underway by this same group at that sifter to come up with recommendations in light of the Rogers, of the Rogers um, outage. But where will these accommodations actually go to? Where will they land? Will there be any action in modifying the regulatory framework that has existed for the last two decades to allow competition at the different network layers, to, to allow multiple homing, to allow multiple um, dark fiber availables in different parts of the, uh, of the country, and resolve the issues that we have heard from, from the previous panel about condominiums and lack, lack of access and lack of choice? This is actually is what we're looking for, not only the recommendations, but the political will to act and modify the regulatory framework to can implement these recommendations and allow more competition. Sure. Thank you. Here, here. Um, so it sounds like we have at least two candidates for uh, leader of the CRTC if uh, familiarity with the operation of networks and economics are concerned on this panel. Are you ready for when you're ready for questions, I have a question. Sure, fire away. <laughs> Matt, you've said that the border gateway <laughs> protocol BGP is. is uh, right. You've said that BGP border gateway protocol is the basis upon which the internet exchange is tracked, and you've said that the uh, Rogers uh, downloaded the entire BGP atlas rather than a portion of it. Excuse me. Was this not totally boneheaded? I mean, it doesn't. The entire world modified BGD, B, BGP tables, you know, many times a day, many times a week, and this occurs without major network failure. It does. It does happen all the time, and ninety-nine point nine 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 percent of the time, it happens with no incident. But in 2019, 2020, Facebook took itself down doing the same thing. Twenty nineteen, Verizon took itself down doing the same thing. Um, every once in a while, people shoot themselves in the foot. The difference, I think, is the blast radius of what happens when that happens. <laughs> and I, I love that term in technology, because if you think about it, how much stuff is going to blow up when I, when, I, when I break this thing, right? And if I break Facebook, I can't share photos of my cat. But if I break Rogers, you know, a large number of radio stations go down, 911 goes down, just cable TV goes down, internet goes down. That is a massive blast radius. And the one thing in technology we need to do is try to limit those blast radiuses. And we need to find ways to make sure that when Rogers does do things, that radius gets smaller and smaller. And when we do things like let them merge with Shaw, that radius just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Point taken. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, and this question is for anyone who would like to answer, I was wondering if you could speak to uh, lessons learned or examples to follow in the way other jurisdictions regulators have handled communications failures, especially in the wake of natural disasters like Hurricane Fiona. I used one example of a regulator that Singapore, for example, regulates uh, structural separation. So they separate that the fiber, who owns the fiber in the ground and who runs the service on top of it are two completely separate entities. So one company goes and lays all the fiber down and then you choose your ISP on top of it. And that model keeps the networks more resilient because the physical fiber is one thing, that's not gonna go fail. What's gonna fail is the, the application of the layers above that. So if your ISP has a failure, that's fine, but that limits the, again, the blast radius of one ISP has a failure, their customers are down, but the rest of the ISPs are still running. So that's one regulatory framework in the world that has at least helped provide some more resiliency. Yes, I can, can, can add to this point. Um, yes, um, structural separation is certainly an important point, but it's key that the, 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 the player at this uh, structural level, the fiber level, for example, does his due diligence and builds really a resilient network that can um, can sustain or sustain a single point, does not have a single point of failure. Uh, 
this is very important. It's not only is it separated in terms of functionality and investment, but the architecture that's being implemented is um, um, strong enough to sustain a single point of failure. And this requires an oversight from the regulator that invest investment in the right way, in right architecture is, uh, is, is implemented. The second approach could be a facil facility-based competition. So you have multiple players in the same network layer and they compete to provide most adequate service to, to the end, end customer, be it an enterprise or home or, uh, or um, uh, small or large uh, ISP connected to them. So competition at the network layer is also one own approach. Unfortunately, in Canada, we don't have, we don't have either. So we should, should make a decision which, which is the best way for Canada to move forward, to allow competition at every network layer and ensure that no one has a monopoly or, for example, fiber connectivity and prevents access to conduits, as we heard in the previous panel? Or should we separate that one operator only has, has the, the fiber connectivity, the second has the service layer and then the applications on top? Perhaps it's easier, easier for us, given the legacy, that we can have competition at the same layer and ensure equal footing to each player at, uh, in, in these cases. So, um, so that's kind of a couple of questions. I, so I, I'll start by saying I think Europe your provides some examples of um, stronger consumer protection rules. Um, they do on lots of issues. I believe they do here as well that we could model. But I must admit, the lesson learned here is a bit more of a depressing negative one. And I think it's one that's been well learned by large telecom companies. And that is that people forget and this issue dissipates over time. And I remember um, lots of people, myself included, were saying that perhaps over the summer this was going to be the wake-up call. Finally, now something would change. But most people responded saying, well, why would it? And here we are. It's rather amazing even now that at the end of November we actually have a panel talking about this issue. Um, but the truth of the matter is the industry committee took a look at this and or look, look at some of these issues but never really dealt any further with it. The CRTC hasn't put it, has seen its feet to the fire over this issue. And for all the calls in the aftermath of this event saying, well, there's just no way the Roger Shaw merger can go ahead now. Um, I don't believe that the minister was even asked specifically about this issue or played, certainly didn't play a prominent role when they announced sort of their new framework about how they might go ahead with this. So frankly, if there is a lesson that comes out of that is that people, um, People forget over time um, because service starts working for a time and people are busy. And if you're going to worry about something, you might as well worry about C11 and C18. Um, <laughs> not really, but anyway. Um, and so most people aren't all that focused on these issues. And I think the telecom companies um, know that. And uh, so too, I suspect, as the regulator, which is why we don't see more action on some of these issues in the immediate aftermath of things that take place. I do not have anything to add of what my colleague said. I think it was very well summarized, but I just want to add one uh, tiny details. The way Oxio interconnects with Rogers makes us extremely susceptible to go, oh, in fact, if Rogers goes down, we go down. That's super simple. And I think that, again, it's showing that incumbents have very little interest in uh, building a, a network configuration that would make us resilient to them. Um, they all follow the minimums that the CRTC asks. And I think if we would go just a tiny bit above the minimums, we could have uh, a service-based competition here in Canada. We were talking about the low-hanging fruits. Just changing a tiny bit the network configuration would allow us to be fully redundant. Conrad? I find this very interesting that you've just this panel discussing it, it seems to me this is really a question of regulatory failure. I mean, the CRTC should call a hearing and say, we had this outage, it is okay, we made a point, what system should we have in place to prevent it in the future? And hear from everybody, from the big boys, from the, from the small, you know, from, from, from consumers, etc., and then fashion a solution. It has the tools. The only thing is they haven't seen fit to address the issue for reasons which I don't understand, and the minister could direct them to say, say hold a hearing, come up with a solution, etc., rather than, you know, we trying here to looking at other and other nations and trying to find what is, what is suitable. I mean, this is really something we want to avoid having it again. And so, therefore, I, I, it seems to me making this part of your agenda and addressing it is something the new chairperson should do. Can I just quickly respond to that, Connor? Because I think that you're 
Absolutely right, and this ties in uh, as well to uh, Michael's point uh, that we need some bold leadership. Um, you know, I think that the government is issuing a direction to the CRTC that has been hailed by competitors as uh, promoting you know, service-based competition and innovation in the economy, and it's been ignored by incumbents because they know that the leadership of the CRTC can interpret it how it pleases. And so I, I wonder, and I say this with some trepidation on account of uh, you know, the, the woes that are being experienced vis-a-vis -vis the Broadcasting Act, is if we don't need a, something to fix that regulatory failure, but at a higher level than just the leader of the CRTC, if we don't need a government leader, an elected leader, to take responsibility for this on, you know, not, not on micromanaging every detail, but at least taking the CRTC, turning the rudder and saying, go in this direction. Not go this way if you like or that way if you like, but go in this direction. Treat this utility as a utility so that we can unleash competition in the places where it can work. And so, you know, maybe it's opening a can of worms, but to me it seems that we the regulatory failure can't be blamed on this leader of the CRTC or that leader, but it needs to be blamed on the people who install the leaders of the CRTC in the first place. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, other nations have appointed a minister responsible for the digital challenge, internet, or whatever you call it. And if you had such a person there, then if we have another outlet, like the Rogers Outlet would be on his plate and he would be accountable and he would certainly make sure it doesn't happen again. So I, mean, I have never understood why we haven't done it, but neither this government nor the previous government has seen the necessity to put one person basically in charge of the digital challenge. If I, can, if I can add one thing in respect to my colleagues that have way more experience than me uh, when it comes to policies, um, I think the CRTC current administration took the stance of let's keep the status quo and be clever with the incumbents. We want to see fiber lift from the ground, we want to see infrastructure lifting from the ground. But when you look at the KPIs uh, that the CRTC is accountable for, and only two because we had conversation about it today, affordability and resiliency. It didn't work. Under the five years of the current administration, we didn't see any more uh, resiliency and we didn't see services getting more affordable. So definitely changing who they are clever with uh, or changing the current strategy or breaking the status quo would definitely help. And talking about resiliency means breaking the status quo. The status quo right now is that the current network configuration, changing, uh, changing this needs opening up the books and being less clever with the incumbents, which I don't think that uh, the current administration has been doing, but I'm looking forward with a new policy direction and the new chair. Yeah, can I just quickly rant that? Um, <laughs> you know, your it, 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 your if, you're paying, if you're paying any attention to what's going on right now, the government is moving in the exact opposite direction of what was just being described, okay? They don't care about telecom in any serious way. Uh, the minister does not care about this file. It's much more, I'm not saying, he's, he has his areas of interest and frankly, uh, there are some things that are pretty good there. He's, he's less about standing in front of large checks and more about running around trying to cut deals, but um, telecom's not a big issue. Um, had he been woken up in Japan by Rogers about the outage, he probably wouldn't have been all that happy that he'd gotten woken up about it. This government right now is, sees the CRTC as a cultural regulator, not as a broadcast, not as a telecom regulator. And so anyone who thinks that suddenly the government is going to decide what we want to do is try to fix these telecom issues, they are literally charging the CRTC with a host of internet regulation, content regulation, news regulation, and at some point in time, online harms regulation. That is the role of the regulator. That will be the role of the CRTC. And without knowing the identity of the next CRTC chair, I don't think there is any doubt that the chair will be the person who is charged with doing exactly that. Not fixing redundancy, not fixing your wireless bill, uh, but implementing the insanity that is C11, C18, and a future online arms bill. We're gonna have a whole other event on that. <laughs> Yeah, comment and a, and a question, so comment, great panel. Um, I, I will say something a little bit mean, though, and that is that I, 
I would propose that there are probably some women that might have an interesting uh, and intelligent thing to say on this topic in the future. And I would invite you to ask friends in the room for, for help to avoid mandals in the future. Question for you. Um, I think mostly for, for Michael, but for anybody. Um, I'm curious if you could extrapolate a level away from what you've just said. Uh, my sense from where I said is that there's sort of a failure of digital policy writ large. Um, you know, we're talking about networks right now, but we can talk about privacy, we can talk about a whole copyright, we can talk about a whole lot of other things. What is it about Canada that gets <laughs> us into this place? Are we a particularly lackadaisical people who do not put pressure on political leaders? What is it that leads us to this kind of a situation? Okay, thanks, and thanks for the comment on the mantle. I totally agree. Um, I'll, I'll start by, I, I, listen, I, I don't think it's unique to us. I think, I think this was a government that had we been holding this years ago, and we did have events. There were events years ago where uh, people were more positive about the potential for digital policy and government, and we had leaders who saw themselves as wanting to embrace some of those kinds of things. Um, I think what we've seen in recent years is a government that has largely handed the keys over to Canadian heritage uh, when it comes to digital policy, combined with a, an ICED or industry minister that is just far less interested in in digital issues, you know, and so we've had in the past industry ministers who saw this as focal points of what they wanted to do. Tony Clement comes to mind, certainly, um, but more recently, even you know, Baines. This was not necessarily a priority, but he did have a digital charter, and and clearly there was an interest in trying to advance some of this stuff. I don't think we have that right now, uh, and as I say, you know, I. I I, there's reason to think that the current minister does some good things, but it's not necessarily this stuff. Um, and so I think that absence of a counterweight within government on some of these digital policies is why we see uh, either an absence of focus on, let's say, on privacy languishing or on uh, copyright, uh, potentially also languishing or some pretty bad stuff coming down, coming forward, or C26 um, being moved forward without really having considered the implications uh, from a privacy perspective or some of the other issues that are out there. And the government has decided, it seems to me, that um, what it wants to put in the window when it comes to digital policy is, um, are things like the C11 broadcast stuff or the new stuff um, or in the future online harms. And I mean, you, you see the framing. I, I'm someone who spends way too much time watching these committee hearings. And um, it's reached the point, let's say on C18, where no matter the proposed amendment, almost no matter who's proposing it, the response from the government is, this is a loophole for big tech, and you're siding with big tech. That's the only response they have. And so they believe that, I believe that they believe that that is politically saleable. Um, and I think it helps explain why we find ourselves where we are. Um, we're in the kind of perpetual time of either positioning yourself for an election or an election. And um, right now, the view is that the winning position is one that largely demonizes big tech. Um, and the way to do that is to do that through a Quebec-based minister with policies that may play well there, but may play less well in the rest of Canada. So I, I don't think, so I, I think it's a purely political calculus and that, that is my guess as to some of the things that are taking place. I can add to a different, different perspective, different angle. In terms of um, technology adoption, Canada is unfortunately seen as lagger in terms of technology adoption. Although we have innovations in particular areas, in, co in corridors, we have the, the, ta the talent and the know-how in Waterloo and Montreal, uh, in Vancouver, where we have the expertise to develop new technologies, innovations, but typically they are deployed at a later stage, after they are deployed in different parts of the world. We have a comparison in Singapore, looking at Europe and Estonia and other places, with technology adoption and the digital, uh, digital um, capability, digital services are widely deployed on the government and private sector basis. In Canada, we are typically several years behind this, this curve. So while we are innovators, but adopters, we are lagging behind. And this has an impact on the, the policy side, because there is no need to modify policy if the, the, the demand and technology perspective is, is lagging behind as well. So we need to put some, some emphasis on, on really what we innovate, we should be the cradle of adoption as well. Not let the world get, only get the benefit and we, three, five years later, we start looking into these opportunities. Thank you. <coughs> um, so just 
Uh, one thing first, quickly, uh, just to update on the uh, the into or industry committee study on uh, on the Rogers outage. Uh, so when they came back in September, the House, uh, the committee decided to send a letter to the minister rather than come out with a report, and they just approved the letter yesterday in their their meeting. So it should hopefully be out soon. Um, so uh, my question though is, uh, I find it interesting that uh, in a discussion about competition, nobody's mentioned the competition here at all as they're challenging the Roger Shaw merger. Or hope they have of actually being successful. Um, and the, the government has just launched a uh, review or consultation on reforming the Competition Act. Um, in 2020, uh, ICED actually commissioned a large uh, public opinion research on the Competition Bureau and Awareness, and it included um, a question on uh, and surveying separately individuals, small businesses, and large businesses. <clears throat> on what sectors they wanted the competition bureau to focus on in the future. And it included 10 or 15 choices. Um, telecom was first for all three. Um, even though publicly the focus is on, you know, responding to digital, et cetera, et cetera. And so <clears throat> what opportunities are there to leverage the competition bureau in a strengthened competition act? Um, you know, for example, you just launched a a sector review of the grocery sector. <clears throat> and one of the things they're asking for is more pop. So right now, they, when they're doing a sector review, they have they can only rely on public information, but they want to be able to compel information from companies. And so the sector review would recommend ways to improve competition in the sector. Is you know there's and there's other things within the Competition Act um, consultation that could potentially leverage. Are there ways to leverage? A strengthening competition bureau and or other regulatory frameworks outside the CRTC to put additional pressure on the CRTC and I said to increase competition rather than just focusing on specifically on the regulator. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, aside from today, I've been glued to the, the blank screen at the tribunal hearings uh, in the Rogers shot uh, at my office at home. Um, and so I think just from that experience, I can say right up front. Um, the Competition Bureau did conduct their market, market study in 2019 of tel the telecoms industry, uh, you know, which provided general, they, they solicited input and then provided general sort of disaggregated comments. And I think from their involvement in telecom in that study and in this current hearing, number one is transparency. The ability to compel information from the companies is crucial, but they need to be able to put that information out uh, in public, right? So the CRTC, I think, can provide an example to uh, issues in competition law. These would be their relationship to the people that they serve. Um, we don't need a secret tribunal deciding what happens with mergers in an industry that you pointed out is top of the list for, for you know, competition problems. Uh, and I think greater, so learning lessons from the CRTC and the way they conduct their business in for the most part, public is a good uh, a good start, um, and also I think greater integration, right? So we have this sort of firewall where the CRTC doesn't get to look at telecom mergers, even though it ostensibly has the expertise uh, and the man the legal mandate to look at telecommunication. There have been memoranda of understanding between the two organizations since 2013, but it hasn't really come to any sort of formal interaction, as I understand. Both the Telecommunications Act and I believe the Competition Act speak to each other vis-a-vis -vis sharing of confidential information between the two agencies. So I think generally speaking, uh, the fact that competition law is on the table for reform should open up uh, a more formal uh, relationship between the two that clarifies and, and perhaps formalizes a role uh, to be played, like the CRTC should be involved in offering expertise when it comes to a merger of this scale, and, or, or even smaller ones, uh, in the telecommunications space and vice versa. Sorry, I'll just quickly, uh, see, we've got a lot of questions, so. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly say, I guess my own read is, and maybe it's just, I'm looking at everything through the same lens, but my own read is that uh, the government's motivation are, is driven far more by foreign big tech companies when it comes to competition than it is um, Canadian telecom companies. Um, it, seem, it seems to me, and, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing, I actually think we would have done far better in terms of how we dealt with big tech 
to have focused on competition and data governance privacy issues than the approach the gov current government has taken. Um, but I do feel in the aftermath of uh, the COVID pandemic in particular and the, you know, the shift to work from home, the government had a change of heart in terms of um, how it viewed large telecom companies. And um, it saw them, it saw the reliance people had on those networks and doesn't necessarily want to take an approach that is quite so antagonistic. And if you take a, if you look at, all you need to do is look at C18, sorry, I'm a broken record with C11 and C18, but the largest single beneficiary within Bill C18 is Bell. Um, they stand to generate tens of millions of dollars uh, from Google and Facebook, assuming Facebook decides to participate in this, um, coming out of that legislation. That's, that's what's at play. Um, and so they're not looking to break them up, they're looking to find new sources of revenue for them. Hello. I said that I would ask that question, but you can all answer it. Um, yeah. So there's been, I've seen two ideas floating out there. One, uh, probably more common, which is to just split up telecom and broadcasting. They should both be under the CRTC. They can be two separate regulators, two separate entities. And another, um, that Canada should have a digital safety commission or digital regulator, similar to what we see in Australia. Um, and so I guess my question is, do you think uh, there is a possibility or isn't it a, a tangible idea to have a digital regulator and if telecom becomes separate from broadcast, should that be, you know, just an internet and telecom regulator or do they become three separate things, which seems like a mess? Uh, that's my question. I, I, I quickly start by saying that I, I think the, the government envisions a far messier, more complex governance structure than just that. They uh, envision a privacy, privacy tribunal coming out of C27 that would provide oversight um, over, the, over the privacy commissioner or at least decisions that come out and potential fines that come out of that. Um, there's a potential for an e-safety commissioner, but I think there's uh, data, and that was certainly as part of their online harms, thought and there's clearly been some influence from Australia, but um, I think they're looking for a lot of different governance structures and to the extent to which there aren't new entities created, it will be the CRTC that is charged with doing it and they want big tech to pay for all of this uh, anyway, so it wouldn't be tax dollars that, that pay for it. Um, I think, I, I, I don't think splitting up the CRTC is the solution and I'm not sure that uh, creating a new e-safety commissioner is either. Um, I think. I think we need to get into the governance questions at some point in time about how all this is going to work, but uh, I would prefer to start with coming up with something that is workable um, as opposed to just creating something that I don't think is and then trying to figure out how we're going to actually uh, operationalize it and govern it afterwards. Yeah, I think you, you, I don't think you need more regulators. I think you need to get the regulator to be more responsive. Um, the current CRTC isn't meeting any of its service objectives. It's behind on every decision. It's basically regulating its slot speed, right? So we need we need to get the CRTC to actually do its job, do it in a timely manner and in a public manner where it's transparent, and then we can have it regulate more things. If we can't throw more things at it, well, it's kind of broken. Lynn? I think it might be the last question of the day. Yeah. I think Philip's got to get to it. Um, my question is, do any of the network guys know people within Bell and Rogers who could maybe take a hit for all Canadians and maybe say day 14 of a 40-day election writ, maybe just flip the wrong switch so we have a massive outage <laughs> on one day that would actually bring all Canadians together at the right time, that would actually bring these telecom issues to the fore and Canadians would actually vote on them as a really important topic. Anybody got any friends there? Please DM me later. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, lobbyist in town. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, it was uh, really an honor to be on a panel with uh, these qualified experts here. And thank you to the audience uh, for your interest and uh, questions. So we'll look forward to uh, Philip's closing remarks and the after the festivities. Thanks, Ben, Jose, Dr. Guy, Matt, and Francis.